started um, just checking if you can hear us. This is Shuvai. I'm the moderator of the session. I can hear you beautifully. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome and thank you so much. We'll start in a few minutes. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. Hello. Welcome, everybody. If, if you could just please find a seat. We're very cognizant that it's uh, the end of a, of a long day, a rich day, but a long day. So uh, my promise to you is that this will be uh, short, lively, very interactive. And we understand that we're the last thing standing between uh, you and dinner. Um, I'm just going to say a very brief couple of words because I spoke in the last session. I think most of you were there. I don't want to repeat myself. And then I'll hand over to our moderator, Shuvai and the excellent panelists that we've got uh, accompanied here. What, what we wanted to do in this session is build on some of the thoughts that we had from earlier about, on the one hand, the growing frustration from Africa and even from the global south, and on the other hand, the growing receptivity and willingness to listen uh, from other parts of the world. And I think if you, uh, intertwine those two things, you bring those two factors together, you see that there is really a possibility to have some political capital. But the thing with political capital is that it has to be invested and placed behind concrete initiatives. And that's what we're here to discuss tonight in this last session. We want to get very concrete about uh, improving the multilateral system in a way that better serves Africa. So with that, and no further ado, uh, Shubai, let me hand over to you to introduce the panelists, and then let's get right into things. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Theo. Uh, good evening to you all. Um, as Theo has uh, intimated, my name is Shubai Nyoni. Um, I'm the director of the African Leadership Center based in Nairobi in Kenya, but I'm also a member of the technical committee of the TANA Forum. Um, I know it's been a very long day um, with very rich discussions and many of you uh, are tired and, um, you know, uh, have heard a lot today, but I hope that um, in this last one hour, one, uh, 90 minutes, uh, we may have the same level of energy that we've had uh, throughout the day. Um, so this session, as Theo has um, outlined, is is one that uh, int is intended for us to engage with some of the ideas on a long-standing debate. The debate started uh, much earlier today. Um, and for that, we'll hear from two speakers and we'll also hear um, a response from a third panelist. Um, and the, the session will posit some thoughts on what has been termed um, an era of poly crisis through deployment of an emergency platform. And we'll hear about that from Richard Gowan, who is the United Nations Director for the International Crisis Group. Um, and Richard is, is online. And he's also written um, quite a little bit about this. And you'll find this on the Crisis Group website, some of the articles he's written. We will then hear some thoughts on Africa and the United Nations Security Council. Um, and I hazard an expansion of some of the, the conversation that started earlier. Um, in the main plenary from uh, Her Excellency Madame Hannah Tete, um, uh, who, is, who is also the special envoy on the Horn of Africa for the United Nations. We will then hear a response from Ambassador Stian Christensen, who is the ambassador um, of Norway to Ethiopia and permanent representative to the African Union, to IGAD and to UNECA. So without much, uh, taking much more time, I'll hand over to Richard who is online. Um, Richard, you have about 15 minutes to, to share some of your thoughts with us, and then we'll move on to Madame Hannah Tete. Richard, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to join you. It is only a source of great regret um, that I cannot be with you in person today. Um, thank you to my old friends and colleagues at the European Council on Foreign Relations uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm afraid that due to the, the time change for this session, I will have to leave shortly after making my remarks, but that is my loss because I was really looking forward to hearing all your views. Um, I'd also like to uh, pass on best wishes from my colleagues at the International Crisis Group, including our president, uh, Comfort Hero, uh, Comfort and our wider team are great friends of the TANA Forum, but couldn't be there in person uh, this week because we had um, some internal meetings in Brussels um, that sadly could not be moved. 
So what am I going to do? I'm going to focus on opportunities for reforms to the multilateral system that will make that system more responsive to Africa's needs, but also give African states a greater voice in global governance. I'm not going to focus on the details of Security Council reform, although that is definitely an issue that is in fashion at the UN at the moment and was clearly on the table in your discussions today. But I know that Hannah will cover um, Security Council issues in great detail and better than I could. Instead, I'm going to focus on three issues where I see space for realistic improvements to the multilateral system. Uh, two of them are quite familiar. Uh, one is about improving coordination between the UN system and the African Union. And the second is about changing the rules at the UN and the rules of UN financing um, to allow the organization to fund African Union stabilization missions. Um, but the third thing I'm going to talk about, as, as you said in your introduction, is something that is maybe less familiar. And it's an idea floated by the UN Secretary General, um, Secretary General Guterres, for a new mechanism separate to the Security Council called an emergency platform that would coordinate the international response to big crises like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic or the current um, global food crisis. I'm not going to talk about another interesting area, uh, which is reforms to the World Bank and the IMF, because as, your, uh, as my bank manager could tell you, I am not qualified uh, to talk about financial issues. Although, if you look at my fellow nationals in the UK, that doesn't seem to hold them back. Um, but uh, such, um, I, I would prefer to focus on what I, I specialize in, which is peace, security, and humanitarian affairs. Um, just before getting into the details, I would like to emphasize that this is a good moment to discuss multilateral reforms. It is a moment where we see the UN system under strain due to major power rifts. And as you said, we definitely see um, the global south's frustration rising. We should also be honest that the multilateral system did not respond well to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's not responding well to crises, not only including the war in Ukraine, but conflicts ranging from those in the Sahel uh, to the coup in Myanmar. The picture is not entirely bleak. Uh, Secretary General Guterres, for example, uh, has been one of the very few statesmen to actually get some diplomatic wins during the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, with his deal to open up the Black Sea uh, for Ukrainian um, grain exports. But even Guterres himself has said time and again, and very forcefully, that the multilateral system we have is not fit for purpose. And he's especially said that it's not serving Africa's needs sufficiently. Um, I do think this message is starting to get through. The G77's frustration over issues such as climate financing and the rollout of COVID vaccines has resonated uh, with the Biden administration and with European members of uh, the UN. And actually one uh, European diplomat said to me recently in New York that the UN membership can't agree on anything right now. But the one thing that actually everyone at least says they agree on is that there should be multilateral reforms that give Africa a greater voice in um, this system. Now, the optimal way to do that would, of course, be to expand the Security Council um, to create more seats for African members, including permanent African representation. But we have to be honest, Security Council reform is a difficult process, even in a permissive environment, and we are not in a permissive environment um, globally at the moment. So I think we heard President Biden talk about a US desire to see Security Council reform last month. I would say that African leaders should take up President Biden on that offer of a conversation. But in the meantime, we have to look for other more limited reforms that we can work on in the meantime. What would those reforms look like? Well, I think we can start with some pretty simple ones. There are some, uh, frankly, procedural obstacles to cooperation between the UN and African Union, which should be solvable through um, some smart diplomacy by both sides. Uh, this is something the Crisis Group published a report on in 2019. Uh, you can find it on our website. Um, I think we consulted with you, Hannah, at the, at the time we were drafting it. Um, but the rules of the two organizations mean that 
uh, we don't see the AU and UN councils effectively sequencing their discussions of issues such as Somalia. And if members of the two councils wanted to go on a joint visit to somewhere like Somalia or the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the rules of the two organizations would not allow them to do it on this issue. We have to find a way to get the UN to provide systematic, predictable funding to African Union stabilization operations. And that's partially because I think a lot of Western countries want to uh, win goodwill from Africa in the context of the global contest over Ukraine. But it's also because they're looking at the security situation in places like Sahel and asking if in one or two years time, we might need to deploy new African forces at considerable scale, African Union forces at considerable scale in those theaters. And so I do actually feel real momentum uh, talking to diplomats from all groups to try and make progress on the funding question. Gabon and Ghana are pressing on this um, as current members of the Security Council and the presidents of the Security Council for this month and next month. And so I, I do think we might finally manage to resolve this, you know, this funding question. Um, but it's not easy. Um, it's a matter of political will, but it also involves a lot of complex technicalities. Anyone like Hannah, who has had to deal with the Fifth Committee at the UN, knows that UN funding is a, is a complicated beast, even when it is politically cleared. So um, we uh, must, uh, you know, we must sort of get down to the brass tacks. And again, I think countries like Norway and members of the European Union could play a significant role in breaking some of those log jams. So those are issues that uh, we have all discussed in the past. Let me now add one issue that uh, is new, and that is the Secretary General's idea for a, a mechanism called the emergency platform separate to um, the UN Security Council. Um, this was an idea that the Secretary General floated in a very far reaching report in 2021 called Our Common Agenda. And in Our Common Agenda, the Secretary General noted that the world is more interconnected and interdependent than ever. That was demonstrated by the shock of COVID-19 on the international economy. And the point has been reaffirmed very clearly uh, this, um, this year, uh, because we have seen a war in Europe, the war in Ukraine lead to um, a ripple of global food price rises and global energy price rises that is affecting uh, countries in Africa in particular, but also affecting um, vulnerable countries such as Lebanon in other regions. So we need some sort of coordination mechanism that we can turn to separately to the Security Council um, to try to uh, bring together um, states, um, the international financial institutions, regional organizations and other actors to coordinate on these shocks to the interdependent global system. Um, that uh, do appear to be rippling around us on an increasingly frequent basis. Um, now, the, the, the Secretary General uh, frames this as an emergency platform. Um, it's still an idea that is quite nebulous, but essentially the idea is th that the UN should be able to uh, bring together um, uh, all these international institutions and key member states uh, in moments of global crisis uh, to mitigate their effects in some ways parallel to the way that the G20 um, convened in during the 2008 financial crisis to mitigate its effects. Now, this is a work in progress. UN officials are still really, I think, quite early in the design stage. But I would put it to you that it is really important that African institutions, African governments, and also African uh, policy thinkers should engage in discussions of what this uh, new global coordination mechanism should look like. Because Africa is vulnerable, as we have seen, to fluctuations in food prices. It is vulnerable to fluctuations in energy prices. And assuming that the next few years are going to be pretty turbulent globally, um, it is really important that African uh, leaders and African technical experts um, should be at the center of any sort of new coordination mechanism so that the continent's concerns and the continent's views are, are fed in to um, the uh, 
um, are, are fed into the considerations of a new emergency platform. So I would put it to you um, that uh, as we move forward, as we look for ways to reform the international system, we shouldn't just think about um, sorting out UNAU relations. We shouldn't just think about funding AU stabilization operations, but we should also actually put some energy into um, putting Africa and Africa's interests at the heart of this new coordination mechanism, the emergency platform. And thank you very much for, for listening. All right, Richard, if you need to leave as we continue, thank you so much for being with us for the short time you were able to. And um, we will immediately move over to Madame Han Tete and she share uh, your input. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So let me first make a few caveats. I work for the United Nations. But in this particular conversation, I am not espousing a United Nations position. I'm reflecting on the conversation, on the topic, from the perspective of an African who works in the United Nations. And you had in the last conversation a huge amount of skepticism that was expressed by a number of African colleagues regarding this whole issue of reform of the multilateral system. So you can see that they, at the moment, isn't exactly the belief that this is going to happen anytime soon. So I think that if we start from that position, that this is an informed by a certain history, then it will allow us to think about what could be a good way forward. Now, speaking as an African and not having consulted representatives or member states of 1.4 billion people on this continent, it would be very presumptuous of me to say this is the African solution. So let me just share some thoughts with you, and I'm sure that in the course of the dialogue, others will also share their perspectives. I think that if we're talking about multilateral reform in a way that makes African countries feel more included, then it starts with issues of process. How is that consultation taking place so that it can be inclusive, it can be participatory, and it can take on board the fact that even though everybody refers to us as a continent, and sometimes that makes you think that it's conflated into a country, 54 member states have vastly different interests, even though they may have common positions on a number of matters. And that's the reason why process of any kind of, in, the, in looking at how we deal with issues of reform is key. And that's the first point that I would like to make. And the other thing is that we have to agree, maybe I'm, I'm, I, I would, should amend that statement, agree a little bit. We have to reflect that the post-world order is not necessarily most efficient for the challenges of today. And therefore, when we're talking about the issues of the Security Council and the way in which decision-making takes place at the Security Council, that's one of the areas that requires that consultation in order to make sure that we have a decision-making mechanism on issues of peace and security that is more reflective and more inclusive. I would also like to build on some of the points that Richard made regarding the issue of participation and the number of seats that the African member states have on the AU, sorry, have on the Peace and Security Council, coordination between the African Union and the United Nations system, and then issues relating to the funding of African led peace support operations. I think that we should look at We'll break this into, to, into manageable bits. The African Union is an important regional organization, but I'm sure that if you had a conversation with regional organizations, so you're already talking about combat operations, and if they have to be able to take these out of their budgets, it will take away from resources that could be used for development activities. And so if we agree that those are strategic threats to global peace and security, then we have to be more open to looking at how we deal with the issue of the cost of those, those um, responses. I'd also add that over the last year, not this year, the previous year, the UN went, had an internal conversation on racism within the organization. And that was because 
there were not just Africans, but people from the global south who felt that the opportunities for advancement within the organization were limited. And that it was difficult to not talk about people like me who have joined the UN usually after our political careers. I'm talking about people who have built their careers from within the organization. That the opportunities for advancement were limited, and it goes to reinforce this perception of this is a Western dominated organization, of which African member states are perhaps spectators but not necessarily participants. And so I think that process of internal reform and issues related to career development and advancement also has to be addressed in order to create more confidence in the organization and its mechanisms. The last point that I want to make is that this issue of finding ways of making Africans and people of African descent feel more included within the multilateral system should not just be a nice to have because Ukraine has happened. African diasporas are across the globe and in many Western countries they form significant, albeit minority groups. And to that extent they influence politics. They pay attention to what is happening in their own environment. They also pay attention to whether they are included or whether they are overlooked. They vote, they debate, they participate in governance, they participate in government at senior official levels. So the way in which our world has transformed, we're getting smaller and smaller, we're getting much more connected. We can't avoid having to deal with each other. And so we're going to have to be a bit more frank and a bit more forthright and a bit more focused on how we do this process of engagement and creating the appetite and the willingness and an effective process for reform so that those reforms will be seen as meaningful. Because if we're not able to look at this from a process perspective and look at how we are going to make this happen, and it seems to be a short term it's, it's something that has, has <clears throat> captured the world's attention because of Ukraine. What's going to happen is that there's going to be even more disillusionment. You're not going to be able to have those frank conversations that allow for reform and allow for meaningful reform. Understanding that this will take time, but it doesn't mean that it has to take forever. I mean, when I previously was in government, I remember we always used to receive this report of the C. I think it was the C10, group of 10, from the African Union on Security Council reform. And I always used to find it very fascinating because we had this report coming in annually and nothing, absolutely nothing was happening. So really, who were we kidding regarding whether this was going to happen or not? It, it just seemed like so much of a charade. And I think we need to move beyond thinking of this process of inclusivity and reform as a charade. So, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and for my, in Africa, you know, we call ourselves brothers and sisters. For my brothers and sisters sitting in the audience, I hope that I have managed to reflect some of the ways in which you see this, understanding I didn't consult you before I decided, before I was invited to be part of this conversation. And I'm sure that you can speak up for yourselves as well as to how you see this and how you think that we should be addressing this issue moving forward. But I'd like to repeat, reform of a multilateral system is not a nice to have. It's something that has to be done to make the system fit for purpose. Otherwise, people will disengage from it because they will not see that it is relevant. Thank you. Um, I think we, uh, we see to our client most of the things, the points you made. 
And I think the starting point uh, is that uh, security uh, council reform uh, seems difficult at present, and, and the question is what do we do in the absence of it? And certainly, uh, the decision making process in that more inclusive uh, is uh, and on the on financing is also another issue that we uh, need and we should be more closely at. Right? Um, just, uh, but allow me to say a couple of other points, and I'll try to be brief because I realize that we are at that time today. Um, first of all, um, start with the conclusion: uh, multilateralism is not a la carte. Um, it is give and take. I think we all have to recognize that it has costs to governments at times uh, to submit to uh, multilateralism. But commitments are, are done by governments on behalf of the, uh, in the interest of their citizens. If the citizens stay, the governments come and go. And that is important. Um, and to preempt uh, suspicions of a hidden agenda on the part of Norway, uh, Norway is also for multilateralism, as it is in our interest as a small country. Um, there is a saying in Brussels um, that uh, Europe uh, is a continent of countries, of small countries, and countries that do not realize that they're small. Um, and I think that applies uh, globally. Um, and I think we all have to use that as a starting point for understanding why multilateralism is important for all of us. Um, and of course, uh, as uh, uh, Tetze has also indicated, you know, if, if multilateralism is to uh, work, people have to feel that um, the institutions will present them. And if, if they don't, uh, the institutions will lack the authority. And that is the starting point for us. Um, we know um, that African countries and the AU will need to have a bigger say in the world. It is a reflection of uh, Africa's growing population, growing economy, and its enhanced geopolitical role. And uh, you know, when you look at the Security Council, uh, you can understand the changes are needed. If we compare Africa's representation to African matters on the council table, it becomes very, very clear. Um, so uh, we have, of course, as Norway, over many years supported strong African representation on the council. Um, we would like to see an expanded Security Council with more non-permanent seats for Africa as well as permanent African representation, but I think we, we, we are in a situation where that may not be on the table. So if that's the case, then what is we said? Africa, first of all, must make use of the options that are there. We've seen the voice of, of the A3 uh, strengthening and the A3 coming together and making a difference and becoming a force to be reckoned with. And that is a development that we very much well. Um, like the efforts to strengthen cooperation with the 10 the coming together of the AV is a way of ensuring the system works for us, for countries like Norway and for African countries. Um, so as I said, you know, we need a system that works for everybody to have the authority. Um, for example, we believe then meeting with the AEB Security Council and the EU Security Council is crucial, and more cooperation, more joint meetings and field visits would be beneficial. We support the AEB's office to the UN and the EU's office to the AEB because we believe in strong link and we want to see strong groups of friends for the AEB and UN in both parties and the EU. Um, so, as I've said, you know, this is a strong. Um, the stronger voice for Africa is good for Norway, because what, for what we want to do as well, because we see eye to eye on most issues peace diplomacy, climate and security, women, peace and security, human rights and security council reform, to mention so. Um, um, but you know, uh, as indicated initially, uh, if, if we want that, and if we want a more um, credible, uh, world order and uh, it was a process. I mean, we as Norway also have benefited from the system the way it was designed in the, in the 40s. Um, so we have to uh, recognize that in order to uh, get the system we want, we have to keep something. And that is also uh, something we say to the Europeans uh, in the audience and others who might benefit today. Um, sometimes we work side by side, but rather. Um, uh, sometimes we work well side by side, but then together on issues. We work in silos. And the big question is how can we work more closely on um, resolutions or relevance of our particular importance to Africa and particular importance to Europe, rather than uh, working on our own and not to do so. 
Um, so, as I said, you know, uh, if we, as Norway, as Europe, are, keep, are to keep our political influence, we need to work more closely with all the other countries, and in particular the African countries. Um, so, I'm going uh, to, I see that my notes are repeating themselves, so I'll try not to cut it short. Um, um, so, um, just in conclusion, you know, uh, Norway sometimes prides itself on the aim we provide, and, and sometimes that may be justifiable. Uh, but, you know, our African policies are the ones that define the political compromises that we have to make, and I think those are the ones that really will make a difference. Um, yes, the continent may be aid, but it wants needs and is entitled to political victories as well. And we should seek out the areas where those can be found. <coughs> Um, if Europe is to be a true partner of Africa, we must be willing to be and to contribute to African countries' political interests. Um, so, um, I think the question is a little bit then, but we have to ask ourselves is what do uh, the countries of this continent want and think differently about what our own interests are in that context. And just to mention in, in conclusion that we have a Nordic African Initiative and then the Nordic African Foreign Ministers Meeting, which is one great area for us to. Uh, to discuss with our African partners on the continent. So I will conclude there and then I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. So um, we've heard uh, quite a lot, but I want to also applaud our panelists for keeping to time, but also ensuring that they did give us quite a, um, you know, a beauty uh, routine information for us to sink our teeth into and also to guide our discussion. Um, we've heard about timing, whether it is the right time to talk about, uh, to have this conversation or for an actual change to take place. we heard about sequencing and collaboration, um, for instance, joint aid, UN uh, missions of the, various, of the two security councils. We've heard about Africans taking advantage of opportunities that are opening up. So for instance, the emergency platform, um, outlined by, 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 by um, the, the Secretary General, all taking it an advantage of the US President's remarks on um, the change in the, in, in, in the processes. We've heard from Madame Hannes about process, the importance of process consultation, what that looks like, um, that the system is actually not working, so these conversations must take place and the rethinking is important. About participation, for example, how that is expanded and how various actors um, from the continent brief the Security Council, for instance. Financing, that if these conflicts taking place on the continent are indeed global and global in nature, why are we not rethinking financing? Um, the racism and discrimination within the system itself. And I would even um, uh, add how Africans, uh, or young Africans, for instance, even uh, have an opportunity to begin their careers in, um, in, in the United Nations system. Connectivity, which we've been hearing about, I think, since the morning, and how we're becoming more interconnected, and some of these challenges, we cannot, you know, they, they are right um, in our midst. And that um, the change system is not a nice to have, but it is actually critical that it takes place. Um, the ambassador has, has very quickly taken us through a very big tour, reminding us that multilateralism is not a la carte, but there is a give and take. But that if we want to, if we want a particular system, something needs to be given in exchange, but also uh, problematizing the working methods within the system and the culture of working and how that can be changed. And um, really the last idea that I've taken from him is investing where there is ideation. And that call is, is, is on everyone, that there is a need to invest where the ideas are taking place. With that, I'll open the floor. Um, so please indicate uh, if you'd like to uh, um, ask a question, make a comment. I'll ask you to keep it quite brief so that we can um, take as many as possible. Um, and, uh, and we will then bring it back to our, our able panelists to give some responses. So please, the floor is open. Okay, thank you. I have uh, a hand in the front and then right behind you. Um, I have one at the very back. Um, I'll come to you in the front. Sorry for, for I am no names. And then we had one at the back. Um, uh, yes, I think Ambassador, that was you. Yes. And please, can you introduce yourself uh, before you speak? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm not sure if this is working, but if I'm wonderful enough. Um, I'll just 
Good, I got two points. My name is Sankia Chigwini. I'm the African Youth Ambassador for Peace for Southern Africa. I also work as a program coordinator at Corona and Marshall in Johannesburg. I'll share a little anecdote which relates to, to the question I'm going to ask. During the Deutsche Africa Conference, um, a lady likened Africa's relationship to Europe to a polygamous relationship where Europe is the first husband and, and China is the second one. <laughs> so my question to, to the panelists is, um, if we're going to have a discussion around the poly crisis, what is the role of, uh, of China in all this? And it can't be uh, something that we can do more. And then the second question relates to, uh, that was the question, and the second one is more statement and relates to what um, Hannah Titus said about making the multilateral system fit for purpose. And Martin Luther King says, those who love peace must be willing to organize as effectively as those who love war. So my question to everyone in the room is, is the civil society organization partnership and several development initiatives really the right way to, to go about it? And oftentimes we see the alienation of the states where the state is in a, as inefficient and there's the alienation of the role of the state and possibly to explain to you, to the taxpayer or whoever it is um, that we're not partnering with so-and-so governments because they are bad, they are not uh, promoting human rights. But in doing so, we actually also give a challenge to policy continuity because we're, partner we're not partnering with institutions that are quite uh, indispensable in the African state. So we really need to rethink partnership with African states in, in terms of developing. And the question to you was uh, the role of China in development. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Juan Burkitt. I'm sorry about the European Union at the office of the Afghan. No, thank you very much for the different contributions and I uh, like very much the different inputs. You know, so we played uh, among the senses of, of, of my affected uh, indeed the, the phrase that uh, you had before the dispensable and it should not happen because of Ukraine. Um, it's true as you know that uh, referring to the, the, the series of folks on Ukraine and the Ukraine General Assembly. Um, it's true that these votes led to reactions in Europe, and they also beyond of this point. Uh, how come that uh, African countries vote on an issue to be considered as a global crisis in such a dispersed manner? How come there are so many abstentions and so many uh, absent, uh, absent and stuff? And uh, also, I'm not going to the last time. Uh, so it's a good eye opener, and I think also it, 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 it does show you that. Discussions is important that we must have, and uh, and also lead to that. Um, also, and it also came up during this panel and also previous meetings because the European Union platform. You also hear more and more, or maybe not more and more, we hear also that what we thought as Europeans the universal values is also being questioned, uh, and uh, also issues related to human rights and to its own values, to democratic actions, democratic governments being presented as Western concepts. So from maybe the European perspective, it is being seen as dangerous, but it's again an eye over and it's not shown the need for other discussions. Um, maybe just to indicate that one, one week before the, 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 the Russian war against Ukraine, the UN and the UN is at their sixth summit, and the summit is generated from the EU, which refers both to, to, uh, to the, the support that both the EU and the EU get to the multilateralism. And also in that same communicate, referring to one of the points which we just made here, and the EU uh, also expresses some of strong support of using assessed contributions for uh, in that in that peace populations. So this also seems to show move uh, matters from the EU in, in this direction. Um, the one point I want to make, because indeed uh, when we talk about reform, we seem to talk a lot about, about the representation element. And I think you also mentioned that uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, but when we look from the other perspective, we have the impression that Africa can already do more to, uh, to, to express a common voice, a global voice. Um, um, for instance, on, on issues which you consider as a global crisis. Um, for instance, also indeed on these support approaches. Um, I think it has been already a long time that, that uh, an AU paper on the funding of these support operations has, has been announced. And we still see this not happening. And I think we can also refer to other action surveys. We see possibility for Africa, possibly through the EU, to come up with a collective voice, independent also from the fact that uh, 
have a sense of the reason that the security comes in. The question is how can we, as partner, work together with our active partners also to support that to come up with the decision. Thank you so much. Um, the other gentleman at the back, and please put his hand up. Thank you. My name is Solomon. I am in the group the Baha'i International Community at the Salaam Office. Uh, in collaboration with our transit office, the last uh, AMU summit, we, we issued a statement regarding the framework of the principle that was governed the relationship between these two countries. As Madam Titi was trying to emphasize, we actually racism, even though our colleagues have individually afraid of very good people, but there is such a racism and structure injustice we are in the institution. So we emphasize the importance of having a fundamental principle or governing framework upon which this relationship should be built and that is the oneness of humanity. That the body politic is very similar to the human body, that the well being of one organ is dependent on the well being of the other. Unless we recognize this principle, we cannot go uh, forward, I think. So if you know, <laughs> the back of the state of behind the curtain continues to, to think how to how to really subdue or how to exploit Africa, it, it, it will work way. So I mean uh, going forward in the, the coming century, I think Europe should be key in terms of the knowledge of the money. That the way we go of Europe is dependent on the way we go Africa. And I, I encourage everyone to read this uh, statement on the oneness of humanity uh, issued uh, on the previous uh, last uh, April the Thank you. Thank you. I'll um, take Ambassador, whose hand is up, and then we will come to uh, Don, and then we will come to the front, the member of the front. Um, so for now, we'll take those. Thank you very much. Um, the Vermont Ambassador is going to the European Union. Um, thank you very much for the discussion. I mean, it's, it's something that is a recurrent topic, but I think it deserves to be recurrent because I think things are moving, and, and I think we really have to. Uh, Use the time to to to, uh, to have an, an engaged dialogue and, and really start finding solutions. And for Switzerland, I, I joined Ski, and I mean, for us, it's also important to really have a discussion on the future of multilateralism because for us, multilateralism is also absolutely key uh, to to, um, uh, to to find solutions at the global scale. Uh, we do also have some self-interest when it comes to Switzerland and multilateralism. With Geneva being the hub uh, of so many uh, UN agencies, I think particular sort of questions that that you and uh, Anna has have mentioned on racism, on promotion. I think this is not necessarily something that that we can directly uh, influence, but I think where we really have to continue the dialogue to making sure also that you know within specialized agencies based in Geneva, these things are actually uh, taken very seriously. Um, Three quick points. The first one, I don't want to sort of give it a different spin to the discussion, uh, but it might be also worthwhile, maybe, to think about. You know, there was this sketch years ago about what does, what has, in this case, the UN ever done for me? And it reminds me of a debate that we actually had back in Switzerland. So, as you know, we, we, we vote on everything in Switzerland. So, there was also a vote on something that uh, was related to the UN system. Uh, and, and so we had to do all of these uh, discussions and debates about what has actually the UN system done for Swiss people. And the list became longer and longer. That, again, I, I'm not questioning at all all the problems that have been identified. I think they have to be taken seriously and addressed, not as a side note, but really put front and center. But nonetheless, is there also room for a debate about what has the UN system, multilateralism, done for, for us? Uh, for the international community, for Africa, for the people, I think there are also some uh, good elements that we can come uh, up with. On the UN Security Council, as you know, Switzerland will join the Council as of January uh, of next year. We've already started discussing also with, with the UN, but also with other uh, members, uh, also of the African Union, on small things that we can do uh, on, on facilitating also the exchange between Addis and New York, also building up on, on previous ex uh, experiences uh, from other countries, 
small things like, for example, our PR in New York trying to set up a call with whoever will uh, chair the Peace and Security Council in the months where Switzerland will have the presidency of the Security Council to not only brief them towards the end of the month, but even before actually we, uh, Switzerland will have presented uh, uh, our objectives of the month uh, of May, which will be the first presidency that we'll have, to really also avoid that image that we, we've done that just for the sake of it, but really to have the time to really bring in also uh, the voice from others if possible. And many other elements I'm not going to, uh, to dwell on that. Final and last point. Uh, so we talked a lot also on, on topics uh, regarding peace and security. Security Council, again, I think is, a, is the important um, um, cluster of, of work that we have to be looked into. I just wanted to add another topic where I think it, there, there, there has to be a, a open and transparent and sincere discussion on, on right size and multilateralism, which is everything related to uh, sustainable development, implementation of the Agenda 2030, uh, humanitarian cooperation. I think there is a, a lot of room there to also improve uh, sort of this right size and multilateralism. Um, back um, in May, I, I had the privilege of participating at the AU humanitarian. Uh, summit in Malabo, and one of the discussions I s we started there was also actually, is there a way to actually better grasp what African countries are doing for refugees, for IDPs, for uh, particularly for humanitarian assistance? Because we are still so much in this system of always looking at what the big donors are doing, what the UN is doing. Fantastic work, particularly from the UN, I'm not criticizing. But I was in a panel with the minister from Niger, and then he told me, Good question, because actually half of the budget that Niger is putting forward for humanitarian assistance comes from the state budget of Niger. Whereas we always believe that Niger, all everything, all the humanitarian activities in Niger are funded by international partners, which is simply not true. In our host country here in Ethiopia, um, both the central government, but also, um, for example, the, the, the government of the Somali region, they are doing immense work in hosting displaced communities and refugees, in, in giving them access to education, to land, to work, to mobility, this costs money. And I, I'm mentioning this because I think if we start having a more transparent debate of what that actually means, maybe this also changes a little bit the power uh, imbalance that still is there, although I think we did in the 2030, we try to work from that, but it's still in there believing that the implementation of the Agenda 2030 or humanitarian work depends exclusively on international donors, when quite the contrary is, is, is the case. It takes all of us, but I think we have to pay more uh, attention also to what comes from the members, from African countries, for example. And I mentioned that also in view of a possible next Agenda 2045. I don't know what the plans are, but I think uh, also latest there, I think we really have to review also how we are working together and really also paying tribute uh, and recognizing, actually putting a figure on what comes from Africa because this is actually quite staggering and important. Thank you, Ambassadors. Um, can we uh, get the microphone to Don and then um, he's sitting on this side? Then there was one last hand. Oh, okay, two last hands. One um, in the front here and uh, Luta, I think this is the front. And, and then we'll close the you know, Thank you very much, Shubhai. Uh, I'm uh, um, Just to thank the three panelists, I think many, most of what they've said, we, we, I, I personally agree on this metric. And to just adopt so that we don't repeat them, I really adopt the recommendations made by Excellency Hannah Tete. Uh, and to say that there's reform, reform of attitudes, reform of policies and practices, including human resources policies and practices within the UN family, that would be easier to do. Uh, and for us, as she said, that even though the institutional reform, especially of the UN Security Council, might be more difficult, we must continue raising That conversation is not separate from the conversation about multilateralism and improving multilateralism. Because we have those interactions in multilateral spaces, as well as as a bilateral level. And of course, member states can decide how they want to engage bilateral. I think it's important to note that the primary actors in the multilateral space are the states. Is the state, 
But when you are talking about issues relating to peace and security, especially where the state is weak, and where institutions are weak, and where in order to be able to help to build back those institutions, you have to be able to engage with a number of stakeholders. That's the reason why I suggested that discussions under the area Recording in progress. Under the area formula, which allow for a broader range of stakeholders to be part of that conversation, can be a way of addressing that issue. And it's not the case that, I don't think it's a case that the values are so distinctly different between Europe and Africa. But I think that with some aspects of the values that we share, including respect for human rights, the way in which those rights have been interpreted, maybe within a European context, have not yet been taken into consideration in the same way within an African context. And the debate on LGBTQ issues, for instance, is a case in point. But I don't really believe that. But issues to do with democracy, human rights, respect for the rule of law, and indeed the basis of multilateralism, a rule space order, are things that most African states, I think, as they, all African states, will tell you that they accept. Because just like Europe, we are small states on our own. Without being part of a rules-based order, we would not have a voice. And finally, Ambassador um, Mona, you made the point that indeed what we should not just look at it in terms of what the system lacks, but what the system has been able to do. And I dare say that on the UN on the development side, a lot of good work has been done. On the humanitarian side, a lot of good work has been done. But where we have the crisis, on this continent, those crises are fundamentally political. And therefore, addressing those crises requires us to look at the mechanisms for having political consultations in order to be able to deal with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll try to answer a couple of questions. Um, I guess, uh, what's that? Um, uh, what relations to China? Um, I think uh, uh, my recommendation, if I follow that word, um, is not marry anybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, but try to figure out what is uh, what is in your national interest, what is in your continent's interest, and with that starting point, when you know of where you want to go, and you use the multilateral system uh, <laughs> for that purpose, uh, and you work with those that you are that closest um, and that are uh, that. Um, so it serves our purpose, and, and that will change from time to time. Um, and uh, so, uh, so that will be on that one. Um, the well-being of Europe depends on the well-being of Africa. Yes, I very much agree, and that's what I was trying to say in my intervention: is that we recognise that, and we recognise that it's a give and take. Multilateralism has a price, but the price is much smaller than the alternative of not having a multilateral system that works, and that has been our preparation for many decades, and we will continue to recognize that we all have to find the common solutions. Uh, even if, of course, we will disagree on many things, and we, we agree with you, but with us, there are many issues, and sometimes we disagree. And that can be uncomfortable, but that's, uh, that's how it is. Um, uh, there were, what was it? Um, how to, um, and the last one is just to how to improve trust in the multinational system. Again, it's, it's down to the simple fact that the system has to be felt to be representing uh, everybody uh, in, in a fair, uh, fair manner. And uh, at present, I uh, recognize that that's probably not the case. Uh, and that has to be addressed, and that is uh, part of, of our agenda in all of that institutions where we engage. That we want to make sure that it's ever, as representative as possible of all interests. Thank you. I have to say two last things and I can, I can wrap it up. So it's okay, it's been quite long. I, I, I just want to note that the question on kicking the can down the road has not been answered, but that's okay. I guess it's for the next conversation. My question is for the next conversation. It's been a long way, so I, I wanted to just pick up uh, the point on, on China because it's tied into something we talked about earlier, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap things up with um, the great thanks to China for the able of moderation. You know, if, I think we can contrast China's approach to global order with what we heard in the session that, that I was in two sessions ago. They're, they're really diametrically uh, opposed approaches. China is basically saying that the liberal world order uh, was an expression of unipolar 
dominance of, of the US. So that's the power dynamic behind it. But strategically, the language it's using now, the talking points, are this is our order. We were there at the founding in San Francisco. We signed together the charter with everybody else. We just have some different ideas about the substance of it. You see? And that's, and that's what's uh, opposed to some of the things that I heard from, from some of our, our colleagues in the last session, which is basically saying there is no order, and if there was, it doesn't do anything for us. I think the Chinese way is pretty strategic and quite clever. And that's you know something that maybe we can think about a little bit more. Um, you know, one one point again as we close, something that, that Hannah said this vignette about the the racism that you that one experiences within the UN institutions itself, it, it piqued my interest because it picked up on something that was in different comments here, which is that ownership, which is key for the multilateral system to work, is about more than signature initiatives. Those are absolutely important. The Security Council seat is important. The African Union joining the, the G20 having a seat there as well. But you brought some, some nuance and complexity to it. And I feel like what we need is you know, a structure of reflection on that, focusing on three pillars. Is ownership, what does it mean to be representative? What does it mean to be accountable? And what does it mean to be efficient and deliberate? And that might lead, lead us to more conclusions than these signature initiatives. Not to discard them, but let us uh, lead us into new, to new avenues of thought. Um, with that, it's been a very long day, a very rich day. We promise you a, a short, focused, and snappy uh, session today. I think the panelists did an incredible job on delivering on the problems that I made on their behalf. Um, you have been an incredible audience. It's been interactive. The questions and observations have been terrific. Um, so I would like to thank you. I thank the panelists. Um, it's been amazing. And also, Norway, who has helped to support this committee as well. Thank you all very much, and we will get out of uh, the way of your dinner and close now.